closer to you all now. All right. Well, we are in week eight of the 12 powers of man. So nine. Week nine. We're in week nine. And today I will be talking about divine order. Divine order. Our entire universe is based on a system of order. All the planet on our life, it interacts with other life and there's always a movement into balance, into this harmony, into order. Even when there's a chaotic event, if there's a wildfire or if there's flooding, life eventually moves itself back into harmony with its environment. Our entire solar system is in a delicate balance of harmony. How our planets, all the planets are rotating around the sun. Well, you know, that didn't just all happen by accident. It, it just, it couldn't have. I took this astronomy class when I was in college and part of our lab was we had to use math and do a computer simulation. And we were given a star and we were given a planet and we had to put our planet in orbit around that star using math. My planet managed to orbit my star maybe three times and it shot off into space. And that was 20 years ago, I haven't seen it since. Okay, so this there's a delicate balance, but there's order and it's how things keep going is through order, through order. Even our physical body runs on like law and order, divine law and order, that if something goes out of balance, if something gets out of whack, we experience chaos in our body. Like if somebody thinks they can eat uh, flaming hot Cheetos for three days in a row, things may not work so well, you know, until we get our body back in balance, right? Wasn't me. I don't do flaming hot Cheetos, but <laughs> I know friends who are brave enough to do that. <laughs> so we can get back into balance. We can. But divine order is a universal law, and it's that things happen in a certain order, in a certain way. And there's, there's this right action that keeps everything functioning together. Now, in our own life, that can look like in the activity of our mind or in our imagination, we get an idea, we get an inspiration. Then we have to decide with faith. Can I do this? Yes. Do I choose faith or am I afraid? Like, who am I to think I could do that thing? So this is where we're using the 12 powers. I choose faith. And so I say yes to faith, which means I can bring in the powers of strength, wisdom, love, and power to shore up my foundation, to bring this new experience into my life. Because if I had an idea, if I had an inspiration and it feels really good, it's not a forced thing. It like feels good. Like I received it. What? Could I do that? Sounds exciting. Sounds a little scary. Well, this is divine inspiration. This idea wants to be expressed. It wants to be expressed. And so we can create a foundation for it. And then we have our understanding. How do we put everything together to make this all come together? And then, of course, we have what we had talked about last week, divine will. Divine will is deciding, choosing, and leading. So we, we are constantly choosing faith or fear, faith or fear. Okay, we choose faith, and then we take new action based on that choice, and it brings the idea into our experience, right? Because when we choose from faith, it changes what happens next. So order is about this progression that leads to what happens next. Charles Fillmore said in The Powers of the Soul, Order in the mind of God, and that's, so that's in the universal. Order in the mind of God is an idea of harmonious progress, evolution. Order in humankind is humankind's ability to perceive and cooperate with the law of growth. We have to cooperate with this law. It's doing what it does regardless because it's a universal law. It's just doing what it does, like gravity. Gravity is not just a good idea, <laughs> it's the law. So order, divine order is the law. Now life has a built-in intelligence. Life can adjust to its environment. Life can always do that. The acorn, 
adjust to its environment. It either grows into an oak tree or it's squirrel food, or it ends up in the toy box of a four-year-old or on my dresser because I collect acorns too. The acorn does not fight against its divine program. It just does what it does. It does what it's in a program to tells it, tells it to do. Now, humanity, we have free will. So we can decide if we're going to fight against our own divine program or not, right? So it's humanity that has problems with adjusting to the world. It's, it's humanity that will like struggle. So that's how you can tell if we're fighting our divine program. Are we struggling? Okay, are we struggling? If we're not adjusting our thoughts to be at one with the universal harmony, we might get worked up about everything that's going on out here. Now, moving our thoughts into universal harmony, it's not about just being all Zen all the time and being all like, oh yeah, man, peace. Like go with the flow. I just go with the flow. When we are in alignment with universal harmony, we move into solution mode. We move into creation mode. We're in receiving mode. We're in clear the obstacles mode. Right, so we're calling in, we're calling forth a lot of divine activity into our own life when we're at one with universal harmony. So the intelligence of the universe is always expressing through each and every one of us. We get to choose how we utilize that. We get to choose how we will express it. Are we choosing from fear, doubt, rage, entitlement? If we choose from that, it changes what happens next because we'll get stuck in a spiral of struggling with that. Do we choose from love, faith, compassion, mercy? If we choose from that, it means we're trusting what it is that's working through us and we're trusting that it wants to express itself into our life and we're going to let it. We're going to like open the way for it. So choosing from compassion, love, mercy, is not, is never an invitation to complacency. Never. Choosing from love, compassion, and mercy, and faith. Well, we just, we bring everything in a bigger way, right? Divine order gets to work through us to a bigger degree because we've opened the way for that. Divine order is an outgrowth of our complete agreement. Complete agreement and our cooperation with spiritual law. So are we working with it or are we fighting against it? And if we're coming from fear, doubt, rage, entitlement, we're probably fighting it. We're fighting it. The apostle Paul had, um, he was having a conversation with some of the leaders from the city of Corinth. That's the letters of the Corinthians. And see, there was this new trend happening in the city of Corinth, and that was speaking in tongues. Now, Paul recognized that speaking in tongues was one way to express uh, spirituality. So, you know, it's like, that's fine, right? It's a way to express spirituality. But he also knew that more people were doing it just to be trendy, that there were more people doing it just to show off. There were more people doing it just to get attention. And that's why he said, you can speak with the tongues of the angels, but if you don't have love, you're just a loud, obnoxious noise. Okay, that's what he said in some, in a way. <laughs> I think he said clanking bells or pots and pans or something. Okay, so this is the point that he was trying to get across to the, the spiritual leaders in Corinth. He says this, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant desire earnestly to prophecy, do not prohibit speaking in unknown tongues, but, okay, and this is a big but, but all things should be done decently and in order. He's saying don't try to force somebody into an understanding that they're just not capable of having. You know what you know, you know what feels right for you, you know what your truth is, but that doesn't mean anybody else is going to get it. That doesn't mean anybody else is going to be able to understand it. When we're trying to force our opinion on somebody else and force them to see it our way, we become a big, loud, obnoxious noise. 
Okay, we can be speaking the truth, right? Our subjective truth with the, with the language of the angels. But if they don't want to hear it, then we're just a loud, obnoxious noise to them. Okay, so when we come from love, compassion, mercy, and faith, that's how we make a difference. That's how we make life look different. That's how we make people curious about what is, what are they doing that's so different? Because look at how like, how peaceful they seem. If we meet hate and intolerance and entitlement with hate and intolerance and entitlement, we're just adding to the big, loud, obnoxious noise. Now, divine will, okay, we talked, I talked about that last week. Divine will is deciding, choosing, leading. Do I choose from fear or do I choose from faith? I have to decide that. I'll choose from faith. Okay, we just made a choice. That leads to doing something different now. We choose from faith. What happens next is different than if we chose from fear. So we've made the choice. We decided faith. I chose it. What I do next is different. This is leading. We're now leading through example. Instead of forcing somebody to believe our way, we're just shining our light. Now, I know at the beginning of the pandemic, all of a sudden, there's all this talk about gardens. Well, I decided to start a garden. We got our community garden going. You know, gardens, gardens, gardens. Well, if you wanted to convince another person to grow a garden because you thought it was the right thing to do, would you show them your beautiful garden? Or would you, would you be constantly focused on the guy down the street who has those tumbleweeds in his garden and like there's a broke down car and a stack of cushions off of some couch and you don't know where the couch is, but the cushions are there. Oh, and there's a Hot Wheel from like the 1970s, right? And the weeds are growing through it. Would you talk about that garden all the time? No, you'd wanna be talking about your own beautiful garden, right? We focus on what we are growing with beauty in our own life, decently and in order. Remember there's that but but do it decently and in order because preparing our garden, growing our garden, whatever that garden represents, right? It's the perfect metaphor for anything you want to create in your life. What's your garden, right? But the first thing we do, we imagine in our head, what is it that I actually want to plant in my garden? Tomatoes, the yellow kind, the red ones are good too, but the yellow ones, man, whew. Right, Don? Ugh. Artichokes? Yeah, I'm going to grow some artichokes, bell peppers, right? We plant it out in our head. Then we get the seeds to match, right? We don't, we don't throw a bunch of, you know, squash seeds out there if what we want are tomatoes and bell peppers and artichokes. We plant it. Then we weed it, nurture it, water over and over and over again. Weed it, or nurture it, water it over and over then we have a harvest. Now you wanna convince somebody that homegrown is the best? You give them some of your tomatoes. Don't, don't get them looking at the neighbor's tumbleweeds. No, cause they'll look at that and they'll be like, that's too much damn work. I'm not starting a garden. You give them your tomatoes. You find 10,000 things to do with tomatoes. <laughs> I started slicing them up and putting them on cauliflower pizza. They're so good. They're just so good. But that's what we do. Our spiritual path and our, on, our understanding unfolds as we do things in a certain order. And it all starts here. Am I choosing from faith or am I choosing from fear? That's where it starts. The center for divine order in the body is the navel and its color is dark green. And the disciple of Jesus's 12 disciples that represents divine order is James, the other James. He is known as James of Alphaeus. Is that, I see Diane nodding. Okay, thank you, our pro chaplain. She knows, she knows the names. <laughs> James of Alphaeus, he's also, it's believed, he's Jesus's brother that people only sometimes talk about. But this James represents harmony and balance available through centering our awareness. 
All right, the Harry Potter character. I'm so excited. Ellen, you have to look away for a sec. Look okay. away. Close your eyes. The Harry, okay, Ellen, you can look. The Harry Potter character that represents divine order, Professor Minerva McGonagall. <laughs> Woo! I got a giant head. This hat won't stay on. <laughs> Oh, I love her. Professor McGonagall is the headmistress at Hogwarts. She's the headmistress. Uh, I'm sorry, the deputy headmistress, which means she fills in when when Dumbledore, the actual headmaster, when Dumbledore is not there, she fills in as the as the headmistress. She's the head of the Gryffindor house because when she was a student at Hogwarts, she was in Gryffindor. She's also the Transfigurations teacher. I had to look up transfigurations because I thought, well, it sounds like transforming. It sounds like transmuting. Well, what I learned is that transfigurations is a little different because it is about intentionally changing the form of one thing into something more beautiful. It's so it's with intention. We take a thing and make it more beautiful. All right, so she taught transfiguration at Hogwarts. She believed it was the most elegant of all of the types of magic. Now, I was thinking about transfiguration in, in the role of divine order. Well, part of divine order is adjusting our thoughts, right? To move from fear into faith, to, to be able to keep making that choice so that we can be in, at one with universal harmony and in universal harmony, that's when we're in our Christ consciousness, but we're transfiguring our thoughts. So our fear thoughts, we take those and we learn from them. We're not just like canceling them. We're not deleting them. We're learning from them and changing into love. We're growing through courage, right? So we're transfiguring our thoughts. Now, Professor McGonagall was very stern. She was very strict. If you've read the books or saw the movies, she's very strict. Like the softest heart, I think, of any of the teachers I ever saw. Very strict, though. In the first or in the third book, Harry gets has the opportunity. All the third year students get to go to this village, Hogsmeade, for their very first kind of like field trip. They get to go there and spend the day. But every student had to have a permission slip signed and by their parents. Remember how we used to have to do that when we, we were going to do that ourselves? Well, Harry's uncle, his guardians, his uncle was a terrible person. His guardians were terrible. And they didn't sign a permission slip just to be mean. They didn't want Harry to go have fun. Now, Harry, he thought that Professor McGonagall would bend the rules for him because she knew what terrible people his family were. She didn't even want him to be placed in their home when he was one years old and his parents were killed by Voldemort. She didn't even want him to go there because they were such bad people. So he really thought she would let him go, but she didn't. She said no permission slip, no outing. Now, sometimes when we look at universal law, right, like divine order, and we think, well, I thought I was doing my thing. Why didn't it work out? Why did the, the law seem to fail? Well, I was trying to think positive. Why, why, what's going on here, right? The law doesn't fail us. The law is always the law. But sometimes our actions are not in congruence with what we want. We may want to choose from faith, but we've ended up choosing from fear because we're don't, we don't believe in ourselves enough. We think, no, that's too big. Who am I to think I could do that? Well, once we've changed, we choose from fear, remember that changes what happens next. So as much as maybe we want this thing, if we think, oh, who am I to do that? I, I don't know. I can't do that. That would be so hard. Okay. It changes what happens next. So that's why it will feel like sometimes the law doesn't work out, but no permission slip, no outing, right? So it, it's a pretty strict rule. This one, it is a pretty strict rule. Um, Professor McGonagall, she did also have a very kind heart. She's very strict, very, very kind heart. And she did know when she could adjust the rules, right? And sometimes that happens too, but we'll look, we'll look at that. We're going to look at that right now. 
When Harry first started at Hogwarts, the rule is that no first year students, because they're only 11 years old, no first year students are allowed to have their flying broom at school. And they're not allowed to play on the Quidditch team either. See, everybody at Hogwarts is like crazy about this game Quidditch. The teams ride around on these flying brooms and it's like a mix of, it's like a mix of football and basketball and soccer and tennis and racquetball and hacky sack. And it's all done on brooms flying through the air. Well, you know, what 11 year old is completely prepared for that. So that rule made sense. Most of the first years are not ready for that. That's a dangerous game. However, Professor McGonagall happened to see Harry riding a broomstick. He wasn't supposed to be riding it, right? He was in a class to learn to ride a broomstick, but the teacher had to go and do something else. So Professor McGonagall saw him riding the broom and she recognized that he was above that rule because the rule was intended to keep the first years safe but Harry's skill level was way beyond most of the students at Hogwarts. So a rule was intended to keep students safe, but Harry already had was way beyond that skill. So he was able to play on the Quidditch team his first year. But he exceeded expectations. Okay. So Minerva McGonagall, she did, she also had a very soft heart. Being liked, we know that was not her priority. Her priority was helping her students. That's what she cared about, helping her students, moving them out of fear and into, the, into their potential. She believed in her students. She wanted them to do better, not because she just thought they should do better, because she knew that they could do better. She knew it. She was guiding them to be their best because she knew what they were capable of. And she lived by that. She lived by this truth of divine order, right? She knew that there is a way to do things to do your best. There is a way you do it. You study hard, you plan, you read all the lessons, you go to all the classes, you do it. So there was an order to things. There was a right way to do things. Now she could be kind of fun too. She was talking about the Hogwarts uh, Yule Ball. And she says, well, it is an opportunity to have fun, but then she follows it up with this. But that does not mean that we will be relaxing the standards of behavior we expect from Hogwarts students. I will be most seriously displeased if a Gryffindor student embarrasses the school in any way. Yep. She expected upright behavior from her students all the time. She did not suffer fools. <laughs> She was brave. She was intelligent. She was very private. She did have tragedy of her own in her early years. So she threw herself 100% into her role as a professor. She was strong, steady, faithful, kind, reliable. She was always there for her students. She was a powerful presence for her students. At one point, she was even encouraging Neville Longbottom to follow his path because Neville had a very crabby grandmother. She was so critical of him and was constantly telling him how he wasn't living up to how great his own parents had been. His parents were in the hospital and they would never leave the hospital. So the grandmother was raising him. But Professor McGonagall said to him, it's high time your grandmother learned to be proud of the grandson she's got rather than the one she thinks she ought to have, particularly after what happened at the ministry. See, in the previous story, The Order of the Phoenix, Neville joined some of the other students and they did battle against dark wizards, even though, though they were only 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, right? 15 years old. He stood up against the darkness. Everybody loves to talk about Dumbledore and the huge influence he had to have been on Harry. But really, you know, he wasn't all that available. He was often doing other things. And sometimes he was decidedly unavailable when Harry would try to talk to him, but not Professor McGonagall. She was always available to her students, always. Now these 12 powers, boom, they are always available to us right here. But we have to be diligent in how we are committed to them. We have to be the ones to choose to do it. 
Now, Professor McGonigal, she expected her students to take responsibility for their actions. She'd help them any way she could, like she'd do whatever it took. She would do whatever it took. She support them, she encourage them, but the one thing she was not going to do for them was the work. They had to do the work, but she'd be there in every other way for them. And that's really what happens here at Unity. Like that's the Unity philosophy is we're here to do the work, right? It was one of the things that kind of had me question if I wanted to join Unity 20 years ago, because I thought, oh, wait, I take responsibility for how I'm reacting in the world. <laughs> I, it was so much easier to just blame things. I, I didn't know if I was ready to be responsible for my actions. I mean, it's not, we're not asked to be responsible for all the wrong things in the world. We're asked to be responsible for how we're gonna participate starting now, like right now. How are we gonna participate in this life? But see, it's all up to us. We make the choice, we make the shift, and then we do the work. We look, we look at this, fear, faith. And we choose, we choose faith. And that changes what happens next. Now in the book of Romans, the apostle Paul says, and we know those who love God are helped by him and everything for good. Those who love God, this is about seeing God as an everywhere presence that it is, that it's in all things, everything that's ever been, everything yet to be, that means us, that means you, that means me. God is all things. God is all things. When we understand, when we have this understanding, God is all things, this changes a prayer. Like I remember when I used to pray this way, dear God, please fix this and this out here so I can be happy. Please fix this thing over here so I don't have to deal with it, right? That was my prayer. And I'd probably throw in a, and I promise I'll do this such and such thing. If you will just take care of all the hard work, I'll then I'll do something in return. Now, when we are taking responsibility for what we do next, like how we participate right now, our prayer turns into, how can I serve right now? Use me, use me, God. How can I serve now? How can I bring a bigger light to the game now? What do I do now? How can I organize and balance out my life according to divine ideas now. How can I do that now? And you know, the divine idea for our life, it's just to express more of the divine through us, right? We, we get that idea, we get that inspiration. With divine will, we make a decision. I choose to do this because I'm, I'm being divinely inspired. I received an idea and it wants to be created. It wants to be expressed into my life. Everything that we need to call it forth is already available right here. It's already all available. And this is how we are creating heaven on earth. So until next time, remember, you are the activity of spirit in a body. You are the heart and the soul and the hands of spirit in this world. You are soul designed to do all of this stuff, you are soul designed for growth and goodness and everything you do, you are blessed. And so it is, so it is. All right, and I do have a song for you. I'll do a closing song. I keep changing my mind about this song that I want to <laughs> um, But then after Taylor's meditation, I thought, all right, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play, um, this is a new song. It's called This Heart. And you wrote it. I yeah, I wrote it. It's an original. And actually, I think I think I just wrote it Thursday. Like it was just Thursday. So it's it's still a baby song. This life shows you all came here for how to turn what you fear into an open door this heart reveals the truth of who you are the secrets of your 